all the way. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. I once was lost, but now I'm found. was blind, but now I see. Our scripture today comes from the uh, 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And the title of the sermon is When He Came to Himself. So let's read this. Luke 15, verses 1 to 3, then we skip over to 11 to 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. Younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran out and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, what was going on? He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command. And yet you have never given me even a young goat. So that I might celebrate with my friends when this son of yours comes back who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and he's come back to life. He was lost and has been found. May God add his blessing to the reading of this scripture. Today's sermon again is titled, When He Came to Himself. Well, there's always a challenge when you do a sermon, I would think. I haven't been doing these that long. But there's always a challenge when you do one that's very familiar. This is a very familiar passage, isn't it? People just use that term, the prodigal son. They don't really know what it means a lot of times, I think. They just say, the prodigal son. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I look up the word prodigal. And the word prodigal isn't always what you would think of in this case. The the word prodigal just means wasteful or extravagant spending. It has a different connotation than this, but it was symbolic. This story is so well known. Again, it's a bit of a challenge. So bear with me because I said, Lord, give me something different this week. And I believe he did. So just bear with me. I'm going to give you the the takeaway right off the top. So we're going to try to focus on this one thought throughout this sermon. And here it is. 
When we trust in Christ, our true identity, our true identity is as a child of God who loves us and forgives us no matter what we have done. That's the way we need to look at ourselves. When we trust in Christ, our true identity is as a child of God who loves us and he forgives us. He doesn't hold things against us. He he loves us and he receives us just as we are, no matter what we've done. Amen. So that's the key. So let's let's look at this today. He wasn't who he thought he was. He he may have thought of himself this terrible sinner. Who took the money and ran. Remember that song? Take the money and run. I don't know who sang that. I can hear it in my head. I think it was the Steve Miller band. <laughs> Take the money and run. Stacy's nodding her head. Stacy, you going to do some karaoke something? <laughs> I'm giving you bad time. But, 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 you know, you hear these songs come up and you go, well, there's a lot of biblical truth in some of these old rock songs, you know. I remember the other one, uh, you can't always get what you want by the Rolling Stones. Well, that's true. So be content with what you got. That's what they didn't tell you. <laughs> We could have a field day with some of those titles. One of these days I'm going to do a story or a sermon just on titles of rock songs and how they apply to our spiritual life, even if they didn't intend to. Well, this young man did some things that were just kind of outlandish. He takes this money that really wasn't even his, and he goes up and asks his father for it. Very inappropriate, very out of character. In that particular time frame, kind of like now, there would be what we would call an inheritance. And typically, of course, to get the inheritance, the person has to die. The person has to pass away. In that particular day, the older son would get two-thirds. The younger son would get one-third. And so the son goes up to the dad and says, Hey, Dad, I want my money. I'm getting ready to go out to the bright lights and need some cash. I'll take my inheritance now. Just cash me out now. The father probably knew it wasn't going to end well, but he does what the son asks him to do. He gives him his share of the money, of the inheritance. And within a couple of days, the son has packed up and he is off to the bright lights of the big city. He's left his father behind. He's left the farm behind. And he is on the way to what he thought was going to be a great destiny. So we know him as the prodigal son, but you know, that really wasn't his true identity. He definitely fit the definition of what a prodigal is. He went out and blew his money and wasted it. Kind of like a lot of us might do today where we maybe get a little full of ourselves and we do things. We look it back later and go, why did we do that? But, you know, we have to go through the process sometimes to get to the point where we realize, what were we thinking? You ever had that happen? I've kind of looked back many times. I'm going... What in the world was I thinking? And yet God still has a reason. He works things out. You mean? It, it, it's all part of the plan. We don't understand it maybe at the time. Sometimes we think that we know more about how to run our lives than God does. And, you know, the thing about the Father in this case, just like God our Father, He gave us a free will. And He allowed us to, to choose what we wanted to do. So the Father probably goes, I don't know. Here you go. I mean, you don't hear any, like, son, can we talk about this? Or you're going where? You're going to Las Vegas. You know, where are you going? Oh, this is not good, son. This is not going to end well for you. But he doesn't say that. He gives him the money and the son takes off. And the father lets him do his own thing, even when he knows what the final outcome will likely be. But I believe the father also had a bigger picture in mind. He was waiting for him to come back to his senses, come back to himself and to come back home. It's hard to do that as a father. I'm sure God has that same struggle sometimes when his children wander off as we all have. See, this story about the prodigal son, it could be my story, your story. It is our story. Let's just be honest. It's all of our stories. There's no one here in this room that can't relate to this story in one way, shape, or form. We may see ourselves in all three of these main characters. The younger son, the older son and the father. We may see bits of ourselves in all of these areas. But I want to take a little different look today because I think what it's really hit me this week is the actual prodigal son. It's kind of like you turn that, that little thing. Let's say there was a red, the blue, and a green thing. The red's the son, the blue's the father, the green is the older son. I flipped it around 
and it lands on the blue, the, the, the younger son. We're going to talk about him today. Could talk about any of them. But here's, here's what I came across this week that's so, I think so impactful for me. And it's one that I probably will be dealing with and maybe you will. And that is that we a lot of times picture ourselves in the ways that we really aren't. We, we, we see ourselves as the kind of the sum of all of our life experiences. And, and a lot of those experiences are things that if we had to do over again, we probably wouldn't. We would do things differently. We can all say that. That's all. That's just being honest. And we start peeling back the layers of all these things we've done to get to our real self. And when we do that, it's not so scary. And we find out in the bottom there, there's our father waiting for us. But sometimes to get to that point, we have to pull off and uncover all those layers that we've put on ourselves over the years. That is a, 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 a real challenge for a lot of us because many of us think about the things that we have done that we just keep playing like a, like a videotape. It goes over and over, loops over and over, loops, loops, loops. And you think you're done with it, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about that, then it loops again. That's our memory, that's our mind. But I believe that comes from the devil. I don't believe it comes from God. Because God has forgiven us and he's forgotten. So why does it keep coming up? Well, it's because the devil wants us to stay stuck where we were. So that's where I think all of this comes from. Now, it is true. It is true that many of us have to learn the hard way. Isn't that the truth? I remember the song by DC Talks. Some people got to learn the hard way. It's a great song. You can Google it sometime. It came out about 1997, 96, 95, something like that. And that's so true for a lot of us. We many times either have to hit rock bottom or close to it so that when we're down on our back, all we can see is God. But you know, it's interesting to me when I do that. It's never a, an angry God. It's never a God of, of uh, condemnation. It's a God of love. He's got his arms out just waiting for me. That's, that's the kind of God that we serve. So the difficulties may not be fun to go through, but God has a plan and a purpose for us. And that's never going to change. So this son goes off to the distant land. And obviously when the money's there, man, the good times are rolling. And what's that old saying? You got the money, I got the time. You ain't got no money, I ain't got no time. <laughs> you know, that's sort of how it is. And pretty soon the, the friends, the money's gone and their nerves, the friends. And you know, years ago they taught me always plan for a rainy day. Don't always plan for sunshine and roses. You better plan for some tornadoes and some hurricanes because that's what's going to hit you eventually. So this young man finds himself now not only out of money, out of friends, but there's nothing for him to do. He's having to try to survive in the midst of a terrible famine. Think of all the famines in the Bible, though, that God used. Think, I'm thinking of Joseph's family that came to Joseph when he was in Egypt. The terrible famine brought the family over to Egypt, where Joseph was helping to be one of the top rulers. God uses so many things just to bring us to himself. Always. You look back over your life. I look back over mine and go, wow, I didn't know that was going to result in this but so many times it does that's just how things work and this prodigal son ends up hiring himself out to um someone who needed some help on the farm let's just put it that way i don't know if they had indeed on their mobile phones back then but somehow he knew there was a job needed at this farm it was a pig farm now as you know jewish people didn't like pigs or pork still don't for the most part it's it's unclean not only is he touching the pigs, he's feeding them, and he wants to even eat what the pigs are eating. That's how far down this poor gentleman has gone. Eventually he goes, I'm thinking back to home. And I love this phrase in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. It says, he came to himself. And I used to think, well, he came to the end of himself. No, he came to himself. His real self. He, I believe, realized that the light had finally shone through all the layers that he had put up. This person that he was trying to be, this, this image he was trying to project. And now all that's left is who he really is. And that's who God had made him to be. And so he, I believe, is truly 
penitent. He's sorrowful. He goes, I'm going to go back home. And he starts rehearsing these lines. Did you notice how he re- rehearsed the lines? He said, I'm going to go back to my dad and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. Would you make me one of your hired hands? He, he, he was rehearsing this because that's what he really felt. I don't think he was trying to pull a con job on his dad. He really felt that. He goes back and, of course, you know the story. As he's getting closer, there's the father. The father is looking for his son. The father has never stopped looking for his son. He's always waiting for us to come home. All of us. Doesn't matter what we've done. Doesn't matter where we've been. And, you know, God uh, is our loving father. And we will just remember that. So many times, and I've said this just recently, but I'll say it again. So many times we make out God to be like a human. Well, son, come here. Did you finally learn your lesson? I hope you learned your lesson. Go ahead, take it. Go ahead. You can work as a slave over. You can work as a servant because you know what? I'm not going to forget what you did to me. That sounds like a human, doesn't it? You ever know people like that? There's a lot of people, about 98% of the people I know probably that by some degree. He, he comes out and he embraces his son and he kisses him. The son gets out one line. It says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And it stops. He doesn't even get to the point about wanting to be his servant. It stops right there. The father says, come quickly, put a royal robe on, give him the best robe, get him a ring, um, kill the fatted calf, put sandals on his feet. Man, we're going to celebrate. The son who was lost has now come home. The son who was uh, dead is now alive again. We're going to celebrate. Isn't that interesting how they're celebrating and then the older son comes in. And, we, and you know, that's the, the tragic part of the story to me is the older son. And sometimes I have to say that older son sure seems an awful lot like me. Where the resentment comes in. Well, wait a minute. Why are you so nice to him? Here, look at all the stuff I've done. I've always been there for you, Dad. I've never done anything wrong. Yeah, right. Uh, but you know, but that's what he said. In his mind, he was self-righteous. He, he, he was like, I'm so good, Dad. You know, I never did that stuff. I really wanted to. I just didn't. You know, um, the dad doesn't argue with him. And what's he say? He says, you know what? Come on in anyway. Come on in. Let's celebrate. And, 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 and he said, uh, you know, this son. Oh, and the, and the older brother says, this son of yours. He didn't call him my brother. He's this son of yours without wasting your money. Where's the love? Where's the forgiveness? Something didn't hit home there. The dad says, look, come on in. You know, whatever I have has always been yours. It's always been yours. You've got whatever you need. But we've got to celebrate now that this, your brother has come back. He was lost and now he's found. He was, he was dead and now he's alive again. The, the, the father and the son had found that reconciliation. That comes from the love of God for each of his children. So the son, I think, realizes now, this prodigal son, that now he realizes finally that in this relationship with the father, I am who I was created to be. I'm a beloved son of my father. And you can say I'm a beloved daughter of my father. That's how he sees us. Can we see ourselves the same? That's the question. Because once we do, everything will change. We will quit crucifying ourselves. Christ already did that for us. We don't have to go on the cross. Christ took care of that for us. Amen. So this story isn't about the prodigal son or the brother so much. It's really about the father, as we know. See, he offers reconciliation rather than rejection. Acceptance rather than accusation. And compassion rather than condemnation. That's what the father brings to the son. I read something this week. I get, I think I've told you, I get a number of devotionals in my email. And if you ever want them, I'll give you the, the links. It's, I get like 11 a day. I don't always read them. But some days I do. Some nights I get up at 2 in the morning. I'm like, well, I don't want to get up quite this early. And I'll just start reading. They come in about midnight, 1, 2, a lot of them. This one came from Joseph Prince. And if you'll bear with me as we get ready to close, I want to read this to you. Because I thought, well... This was about as well put as I could. It's called, it was from March the 23rd, which would have been Wednesday. It's called Break the Cycle of Defeat. And this is what it's, I'm going to read it word for word. People who believe erroneously that God is hard on them for their failures will inevitably be hard on the people around them. And most of all, they will end up being really hard on themselves. I find that to be pretty true. 
They cannot forgive themselves for the mistakes they've made in the past and end up pushing themselves, whether they know it, or punishing themselves, excuse me. Let me read that. They cannot forgive themselves for the mistakes they've made in the past, and they end up punishing themselves, whether they know it or not. Again, they they try to go back up on the cross that Christ has already been up on. We don't need to go up there. He did it for us. It's a vicious cycle of defeat. The more they can't forgive themselves, the more they hurt themselves with all kinds of behaviors, and the more they end up bound by various destructive addictions. This leads to even more guilt, which in turn drives them to punish themselves even more. And the cycle continues. I believe the root cause of many sinful habits, fears, and addictions can be traced to condemnation. I want to talk to you today about going after condemnation as the root to help you receive God's forgiveness in those areas that you, so that you can break out of your cycle of defeat and step into a new cycle of victory. Are you living with some unresolved guilt and condemnation today? I have great news for you. When you realize that God's heart is not in condemnation but in forgiveness, your entire life can be turned around for his glory. I personally witnessed so many lives transformed when they just take a small step of faith to believe in his grace and receive his forgiveness in their lives. Instead of punishing themselves for their mistakes and disqualifying themselves, these people began to correct their beliefs and receive God's forgiveness by seeing Jesus taking on their punishment. They began to see their Savior qualifying them to receive every blessing from God for their marriages, families, and careers. Right now, I want to encourage you to release the built-up guilt and condemnation for whatever mistakes you've made over the years to the Lord. And it says, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I don't want to live under guilt and condemnation anymore. Today, I release all my failings, sins, and mistakes into your loving hands. And I receive your forgiveness right now into my heart. Thank you for your precious blood that washes me whiter than snow. Right now I stand in your righteousness, favor, joy, and peace. Amen. It's a simple but powerful prayer. And then he says, I encourage you to pray this prayer every time you fail and experience guilt and condemnation in your heart. Stop punishing yourself. Your answer is found at the cross of Jesus. I promise you that when you turn to Jesus and remind yourself, Just how forgiven and righteous you are in Christ. Every time you fall short, you will start living like the forgiven and righteous person Jesus made you. We're getting ready to close. I I would just add this right here. When we live the way Christ wants us to live, we will start seeing ourselves the way he sees us. I don't care your age, your background, what you did, what you didn't do. We just all have to receive Christ at his word, that he loves us just like we are. It's one thing about the Father I wanted to add. It's one thing to believe in a God who would receive sinners like you and me. It's another to know that our God tenderly searches for sinners and then joyfully receives them. We have an active God. He's not just passively sitting up there waiting on us to come home. He's looking for us, and he runs to meet us. It's the only place in the Bible that says God ran. It's the only place. This one. God runs to us. He loves us that much. This is extraordinary love. My last thought. Ultimately, we can see ourselves the way God sees us. I believe we can do that. We're broken people. We need a little help. Actually, we need a lot of help. We all do. And knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that our Father is waiting for us, running toward us, to meet us right where we're at, to throw his arms around us, and to welcome us home. Amen. That's the beauty of knowing God as our Father. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time today where we can remember the story of the prodigal son, this great message, Lord. So many different areas we could look at. Lord, I just thank you that you've opened up our eyes today, I hope, Lord, so that we can just realize how much you love us and that you don't ask us to do anything just to come to you. That's all we got to do. You didn't ask us to clean up our act. You didn't ask us to punish ourselves, to do all these sacrifices just to come to you. We thank you for that great love you show us. Thank you for running to meet us. Thank you for searching for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Real quick, before this particular parable, 
There were two other parables in here. I'm not going to have time. I just want to, I just want to tell you, if you want to go back and read this today, Luke chapter 15, there was the product, there was the story of the lost sheep where the shepherd goes out and searches for that one sheep. He leaves the 99 behind and he searches for the one sheep till he finds him. When he finds him, guess what? Does he get mad at the sheep for wandering off? No, he loves the sheep. He puts it around him and he celebrates. The lost has been found. That's our God when we come back. Don't ever feel like, oh, God's mad at me. No, God loves us. We don't have to ever feel like we've done something where he has to, we're, we're going to be shame, we're going to be uh, putting ourselves in the position where God comes down and, and, and whips us. You know, he's not going to do that. And then the other was the, the parable of the lost coin, where the woman who had been given 10 silver coins when she got married, one of the coins, like they have a headband, one of the coins fell off and she lost and she had to find that coin. And when she did, she told all her friends, she celebrated. It's just something when the lost is found. We as Christians now, we share that message. We share it with others.